Uh, oh wow, that's quite loud, isn't it? Hi. <laughs> uh, welcome to They're Just Not That Into You. Uh, thank you so much for coming. There's actually quite a few more people here than I expected, so cheers. Um, I'm Rach McPherson and I'm the PR manager for Neon Hive. Um, Neon Hive is a boutique PR marketing agency based in Glasgow. We've worked with the likes of Bethel, Games Workshop and Revolution. But prior to working with me on Hive, I spent my formative teenage years working as a music and digital journalist for a national newspaper. And I'm really thankful for that experience because it allowed me to do some fantastic things. Be serenaded by Busted for one, which was a very weird experience, <laughs> and be in charge of an entire music section for two and a half years, and once write 10 Outlander articles in one day, which let me tell you is a fantastic lesson in how SEO works. For those of you who don't know what Outlander is, well, let's just say it wasn't exactly a hardship to write 10 articles in one day. <laughs> um, so around the time of this amazing Outlander feat, I started to realize that there was this creeping shift within journalism to focusing more on digital traffic and SEO, and that everything was becoming infinitely more measurable from how many readers were on site per minute to how high your article was appearing on Google. And I decided that I wanted to take what I had learned so far and go see what else I could do with it. So two and a half years later, I'm standing here in front of you guys, so I must have done something, right? And it leads me quite neatly onto why we're here today. I am unfortunately not here to talk to you about rom-coms, despite my incredibly witty title. Um, I'm here to talk to you about pitching. Um, so when I first ventured out to start making this talk, I was trying really hard to think about what new things I could bring to this conversation. Um, as I'm sure loads of you have seen, there's some fantastic talks about the best way to format your pitch, what language you should use, what journalists you should talk to. And my initial plan fit really neatly within this box where games marketing and games media and games PR peacefully coexisted. And it would have been quite easy to break down talking to press into five nice, easy mistakes. However, to an extent, a lot of these issues kept coming up time and time again, like timing and research, and I, I will get to those later, but the more I researched, the more I heard about things like games journalist redundancies, the increasing shelving of video games desks at places like Washington Post, uh, games media changing how they were approaching stories against this backdrop of more games and more investment. As Luke Winky says in his fantastic article about a future for games video, uh, video games journalism, the field is in the midst of a brittle paradoxical contraction. The world's power brokers are investing desperately in the games industry, but games media itself is an entirely different story. So, by all accounts, despite a quieter year in 2022, the industry is booming. The popularity of video games is crossing over into other sectors, most notably into TV shows like The Last of Us. Unfortunately, despite the growing popularity of video games, indie video games can still find themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to finding space within the press. There's a multitude of reasons for this, but at the moment, one of the biggest is how the media landscape itself is changing. The video games industry is growing rapidly. The sum of revenues generated from 2020 to 2022 is almost $43 billion higher than was forecast pre-pandemic. While the same pandemic had adverse effects on some larger studios with Steam, AAA and AA publishers releasing 10 to 20% fewer games in 2020 than in 2019, indie games, contrastly, published 25.6 more games in 2020. And according to Steam, their February next fest showcase of demos for upcoming game drew 8.7 million users in the space of one week. But while this is growing, games media is shrinking. The industry has been swarmed with cuts. In January, we heard Washington Post announced that it would be shutting down its video games desk. Other tier one media have also seen massive cuts from GameSpot to IGN, shrunk by ownership groups to massive layoffs throughout the media. So what does this mean for you guys sitting there trying to get the press to sit up and take notice of your indie video game? Well, a few things. The press is turning to focus more on bigger stories that will do more consistent traffic. There seems to be less room for indie video games coverage, particularly in a calendar that is now inundated with constantly shifting AAA releases. We're seeing the rise of things like AI changing the landscape and affecting journalists in a way that's completely unprecedented. And the game's media landscape itself is evolving. The ways of pitching of the past are now firmly that, in the past. In summary, there's now more to pitching than just knowing the right person to talk to and when to talk to them. So, I'm going to preface this by saying that I am by no means all-knowing. As I said earlier, I've only been in the industry for two and a half years. 
So while I would consider myself quite good at my job, like everyone else, there's a lot of things I'm still learning and educating myself on. I wanted to do a talk about my perspective and how I've attempted to navigate these changes, but I also wanted to talk to five other people I respected within the industry to get a more complete picture that would help give you guys more tangible takeaways. And that's why I've got these guys. So Aaron Potter is a video game journalist and Lifetime Time Splitters fanatic who has written for outlets based in both print and online, like Push Square, Wireframe Magazine, and now The Mirror Gaming. Stefano Petrillo is a multi-award winning games industry professional with 30 years experience in planning and implementing communications campaigns. Stefano has worked in a leading role in some of the world's biggest entertainment brands like Assassin's Creed, Far Cry and Ukulele amongst others. A journalist since 2012, Marie D'Alessandri found her home in games in 2016 and is now Games Industry Viz's deputy editor. Um, formerly features editor at Dexterto and now news editor at PC Games N, Lauren Bergen has ploughed as much money into League of Legends as she has to her two degrees in war and history. And the head of communications for award-winning diva agency, Emily Britt, is a deeply experienced strategic PR professional and a very safe pair of hands. She's now clocked up other tw more than 20 years in games PR and house at Konami, Cygames, IDOS, 2K, Square Enix and Pokemon. So I've spent the last six months chatting to these experts, discussing the changes I've seen and what they've experienced and trying to figure out how it affects the work we do and the work that you also might be thinking of doing. So you know that thing I was saying earlier about getting everything down into nice neat boxes? Well, keeping in mind that it's hard to be hyper specific when it comes to the do not list for pitching for indie games, because every indie game is unique and different. These are the mistakes that came up the most often. Timing, so the time between you developing your game, launching it, the time you give journalists to play it, to understand it, and the time you give yourself to put together pitches. Research, looking into who you think would be a good fit for the game. Angle, which is pretty self-explanatory, the angle, the hook, the thing that will bring journalists in and keep you interested. The relationships between you and the press, but also the relationships between you and other people in the industry. And media, so failing to understand how the demands of the current changing media landscape impacts on pitches and how stories are picked up. My aim is to equip you with some of, if not all, the tools to help you navigate these uncharted waters. So, Bearing in mind that I've given you a very brief explanation of all of these five mistakes, put your hands up if you think that timing was the most important mistake to consider. Yeah. Um, okay, hands up if you think it was research. Hands up if you realize that this was a trick question and they're actually all equally important. <laughs> yeah, so you're all here now, you're gonna have to sit through this talk, okay? So they're all equally important. So. It might not be the most important, but timing was definitely the one that came up the most common when I was speaking to journalists. Um, as Aaron notes, when competing with AAA games, the biggest mistake the devs can make specifically relates to timing. So one of the most common mistakes we see as PR is panicking. So the game's ready, it's finally good to go, and you realize you've told like literally no one about it. There's a bit of a race to get it out there. You don't give yourself enough time to properly pitch it. You don't give your, the journalists enough time to play or understand what it is you're trying to do and you don't give yourself enough time to use the landscape to your benefit. This is usually where I would come in, but there's a lot you can do yourself if you give yourself ample time to think about the following, and perhaps most crucially, make a plan. So figure out the answers to questions like, when is launch? When will you have keys available? How much time do you have to complete your game? As my counselor mom has told me many times, usually right before I've made a very terrible mistake, <laughs> You have to think about what your outcome is, what it is you want to achieve. So is it target wish lists? Is it a certain amount of sales? Is it a specific publication you want to get into? Once you've narrowed down that outcome, it's a lot easier to then plan how much time you have to achieve these goals. So for example, thinking about launch, knowing roughly when you want to launch will allow you to, as Aaron says, find a particular quiet week where your game can really own the conversation. This is even more important now when a lot of AAAs are releasing throughout the, the year and you need time to give your game the space to really shine. This can also be handy for looking at what events can be used to your advantage, give you time to write kick-ass application and get it to schedule your big announcements and reveals around them. So while many of these events are becoming more and more crowded, like for example, Steam Next Fest, they're still a really great place to get your game in front of press and potential players. There was a fantastic article the other week in NME by Andy Brown about why Steam Next Fest demos are a vital celebration of gaming's future. 
Allowing press to get hands on with your game, speaking to them at an event means that when you pitch them later down the road, they might remember you and they might actually be interested in what it is you have to say. Events like the Develop Showcase are also a fantastic opportunity to meet with press in person and to allow them to play that precious demo. Keys. Knowing when keys will be available will allow you to pitch early enough to give press enough time with your game. Trying to give press keys two days before you launch doesn't give them enough time to actually understand the game, to play it properly, and then to go back and actually write about it. You need to give them time to play through your game, think about it, process what they've done, maybe go back and play it again, and then put together an article. It's these thoughtful pieces that will really show the highlights of your game and what's really great about what it is you're trying to do. Okay, so you've got a rough plan, or at least an idea of a plan. What's next? Research. Often we see indie devs come to us with a real idea of exactly what they're looking for. And that's great because it's my job to help you understand what it is you need versus what it is you want to do. As Emily says, it's about balancing sharing your creativity with what it is you actually need to sell. But if you're on your own, research is your best friend. There's no one size fits all answer to pitching, unfortunately. So it's important for you to narrow down where and who you think would be interested in learning about your game. Look into some similar competitors, figure out what press have covered those titles, what media outlet do they write for? Would they be a good fit for the game that you're creating? As Aaron says, journalists are far likelier to take note of games similar to what they've covered before, or are doing something so drastically different that they have to sit up and take note. Your research attention is best paid to those journalists who are genuinely passionate about what the type of game or the genre of game you're creating, rather than trying to mail blast 100, 200 different journalists who might not be able to give you the time or even the passion that you have for the game either. Of course, with the current climate, this isn't easy to do, which is why this is even more important to find those journalists who can be super valuable because they'll be the people who will lift you up throughout the noise. There's more triple A's crowding the release landscape. There's a greater demand for video games and increasingly less games media. That's why finding one journalist who will click with your game, like my colleague David did while he was working on Cabernet, which coincidentally is in the indie showcase. So if you get some time, please do check it out. Um, to try and email the one person who will click with your game. So usually we put together a list of journalists that we think will really suit either the game genre, they've covered stuff similar to before, Cabernet is a vampire game, which is about morality, choices, and alcoholism. David put together a list. He looked into people who would be interested in hearing about vampire games. He contacted this journalist from Destructoid. This journalist was so over the moon to be contacted about a game that they're really interested in hearing about that they actually gave David a call out in the middle of their article. <laughs> That's the kind of journalist you want to contact about the game you're working on. The people who are genuinely passionate and interested in playing the game that you're creating. Okay, so you found your targets, now what? Well, what are you going to say to them? It's time to find your angle. So how do you do it? What kind of things should you think about? There's two distinct approaches when it comes to angles really. The first thing is who you are. Lauren says that one of the biggest mistakes she sees indie devs making is being boring, which may be a little bit harsh, but also fair. Um, show your personality, what makes you interesting, and how that informs the development of your game and why the journalist should care. Press want to hear about you and why you're working on it. There's no need to be as buttoned up or as polished as AAA studios tend to be. You can be as human as you want to be. And that's the beauty of being an indie game. You have the freedom to be you. This is what will inform pieces like features and interviews, which can have an impact on who buys your game or raising awareness. I've seen an increase of press asking for interviews to go alongside preview pieces because they want to hear from the developer as to why they've decided to make this game, how that's informed their process, and why that's then come out in this outcome. Print magazines, while a slightly dying medium, are a great place for these kind of pitches. Stefano calls them the prestigious cherry on the top of the cake in terms of coverage. Um, and they can offer different types of coverage to online outlets. For example, CG Magazine, Lost and Cult, Patch Magazine, they're all trying to create publications that offer something different from the norm. They're great spaces for you to try and experiment with talking about who you are, why this is working for your development, and how this has informed the game you've made. As Aaron notes, with magazines, you're able to experiment and sneak things in, similar to the difference between indie games and AAA themselves. 
So the other thing you need to think about when you're thinking about putting together your angle for your pitch is what is your game? So if you're taking your time to do your research, you'll understand where your game sits amongst its competitors. Now is the time to use that to nail down the angles that will help it stand out or make it more digestible to your audience. So what's great about your game? What is the strongest thing about it? Something new and experimental and unique is great, but sometimes you're not always reinventing the wheel. Think about what your game draws inspiration from and how you can use that in a pitch. Can you play as a bipedal octopus? Are you storytelling through a moving house? Are you trying to portray important issues like the environment, gender inequality, or the danger of AI in the future? These are the kind of things you need to think about. As Stefano says, you should find an angle that can help your game be interesting without being controversial. These tend to be the type of things that will inform pieces like reviews. So you'll have seen a lot of ongoing debates around the usefulness of reviews. And while I often think exploring other avenues like feature pieces and content creator streams are just as useful, the power of the review unfortunately cannot be denied. As Emily says, it's not that they are important, it's more that they just are, like death and taxes. In games PR, you can add reviews. Reviews are a fantastic rallying point in getting specialist media to sit up and take notice of your game, however, because you can contact journalists that maybe specialize in a specific thing that your game uses. So, for example, if you have a game that's maybe a Metroidvania, you might want to reach out to a reviewer who specializes in Metroidvania games. They'll want to hear from you, but they'll also have an understanding of what it is you're creating because they've played other titles that are similar to that. The best advice I can give you when it comes to settling on your hooks is to talk to other people. Have your family, your friends, your colleagues, have them play your game, have a conversation about it. If you're a journalist, you'll have probably have heard a lot of people talk about telling a story like you're talking to your mate down at the pub. Think about your game like that. What is it that you would tell your mate down at the pub about your game? What would they find most interesting about it? Another game we're working on at the moment is Dungeon Golf, also coincidentally included in the Indie Showcase. So again, please do go check it out if you have a moment. I had a conversation with some of my colleagues the other day about it, about the things they found most interesting to it. And interestingly enough, one of my colleagues liked that it filled the mini golf gap that's been missing. Another liked the sense of humor and the style, the fact the style is unique. And I like the fact that there's a frog that's a bard. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's all a matter of perspective. The most important thing to consider is what is the value to the readers in the hook that you're pitching? Okay, so you've got some targets, you understand what the press are looking for. Your next biggest mistake is that everybody moves all the time. As I stated earlier, we've got a constantly shifting games media landscape right now. There's more games, more cuts, and less games journalist jobs. All of this affects what stories are picked up and when. That's why the relationships you build between journalists, PR, and your community is so important. As Stefano Petrullo says, he keeps telling his team to work with people and not brands. As a PR, my job is to be the bridge between you, the developer or publisher, and the press. And personally, I think it remains a vital role within marketing a game. However, it isn't always an easy thing to do. But personally, what I think it boils down to is remembering that there's a human on the other end of that email. As Marie says, journalists aren't machines. It's important to remember that they're balancing their own work in an increasingly saturated games market. Show off who you are. Show off why they should be excited about the game, but be succinct and to the point. And don't beat around the bush. Just state exactly what it is you're looking for. Are you looking for announcement coverage? Is it review? Is it a feature? Is it an interview? Just ask them. There's never any harm in asking, so just do it. But please, please, please remember not to chase too much. Give journalists time to reply to your emails. The more you persist in emailing them, the less likely they are ultimately to reply. To give you some context, when I finished as a journalist in early 2021, and I closed down that inbox for the final time, I had 300,000 unread emails. And that was as a music and news journalist. Can you imagine how much more busy that inbox is for games journalists? Keep tabs on the journalists that are moving around. They might move to a better publication that fits your game slightly, or maybe they decide to focus on different things. It's also about making a connection with people. I spent an entire shift the other day talking to a journalist in Taylor Swift references. Sometimes it's the little things that connect with people. As Emily says, you can be as professional as you like, 
but get talking about a game you both love and only the hardest of hearts won't soften. Okay, so unfortunately, even avoiding all of the mistakes before will not guarantee you amazing coverage, simply because the media landscape is so different to what it used to be. The digital news desk I knew way back when I started in 2016 was completely different to the news desk I knew when I left in late 2020, early 2021. The stories being prioritized were the ones that would perform well on site and on Google. And unfortunately, this is becoming a bigger reality for every discipline. So what does this mean for indie video games? Well, Marie says the immediacy of web does mean that there's less time to deliver ideas in a meaningful and novel way sometimes, which coupled with the fact that there are more and more games means it's difficult to find space for in-depth coverage for a lot of titles. On top of that, you have to contend with the fact that most outlets are operating with smaller teams these days. And so generally we'll have limited time to cover indies over the bigger titles that either drive site traffic or already have a great track record. It means things that may have used to have been boons for indie games like print magazines, for example, or the articles that are deemed important to have, like reviews, are harder to pitch and secure. Harder, but not impossible, which leads us on to our final mistake, failing to understand the demands of the current media landscape. When SEO is the increasing priority, how can you use that to your advantage? Well, there's two distinct things I'd recommend. Firstly, as Lauren says, the SEO world is a beast to navigate, but if you know how to play it, you can sell pretty much anything without being clickbait or boring. You know how I mentioned Outlander earlier? Okay, I didn't do that just because the cast was really pretty. I did it for a specific reason. Some of those articles I wrote had thousands of hits on them within 24 hours. And they are a fantastic example of how well an article can perform when they have great keywords and great search terms, even the ones that were just Outlander adjacent, so maybe about Sam Hewen or Katrina Balf. When you pitch, think about what your game has that makes it more search engine optimized or what might make it easier for Google to pick it up. What keywords can you use to hook people in and include that in what you're pitching? This may be genres or attributes, it may be similarities to other games. So for example, we worked on an early access title last December called Zero Cyber. When we pitched it to press, we said that it was like Escape from Tarkov. They knew instantly what it was we were trying to say. From a marketing point of view, we don't like to compare products to other products. But from an audience education point of view, using stuff like that as a jump off point is a great way to get potential players on board and instantly communicate what your game is about to press, as well as being SEO friendly. As I mentioned earlier, using searchable events like a summer showcase or a Steam event is also a great way to boost your discoverability. People searching for roundups of the event or even just the event itself might come across your game. Getting included in stuff like Steam Next Fest is really popular to get included in a roundup. Also, they're great to find on Google. Secondly, and maybe a bit weirdly for this point, empathy. I've mentioned being human quite a lot in this talk, haven't I? But it's definitely because I am human, I promise. But <laughs> we've all got our priorities and our own workloads. Understanding that the press often need to focus on the bigger stories during busier times, and that the tighter your pitch is, it would be easier to sell it in against AAA releases and huger studios. Press are busier than ever, so how can you help rather than hinder when you're pitching? As Aaron says, give press and players at least one thing they won't be able to get out of their head after seeing it once, and you're golden. So whether it's an art style, a cool gameplay catch, or a catchy soundtrack, just give them everything they need to build their article. It's also important to remember to look at the picture as a whole, and not just focus on your press outcome or your big tier media. Think about your creators, your smaller outlets, and your community, because they can also give you a good boost when you pitch. Another title we're working on is Doomsday Paradise. Our community team is doing a fantastic job on the TikTok for that right now. And it's proved an absolute hit at the moment. I used that in my pitches last week. People being excited about your game will help the press be excited about your game. Like this game, Doomsday Paradise. <laughs> Ultimately, it's about understanding that you face a bigger uphill battle as an indie game and that you have to find the best leverage to get your game noticed your timing, your research, your angle, and who you can call on to help you out. So, as I said at the beginning, the industry is in a bit of a weird spot right now. Video games are more popular than ever, with several big investments being poured in, even as multiple games outlets are subject to staff cuts and closures. Consequently, the news agenda is shifting towards focusing more on games that will deliver consistent traffic and perform well in SEO. 
At the same time, indie games are growing in popularity. You just have to look at the recent numbers from the Steam Next Fest to see that. While some pitching skills of the past remain relevant, like strategy, research, and connections, it's becoming abundantly clear that the approach to PR and to press needs to consider how the industry itself is changing and adapt to that. You can't think of games media as existing within a vacuum outside of the factors that affect other aspects of the industry, just as we cannot think of PR solely about building relationships with press. These relationships are still important, but understanding how those relationships are altered by shifting news agendas and changing media landscapes is arguably more crucial in pitching. As Aaron says, the power of the indie video game is that they have the opportunity to stand out, are able to take risks AAA games cannot, and can appeal to a niche audience rather than pander to the mainstream. So, at the end of the day, the best advice I can give you is trial and error, but learn from your mistakes. Try one specific angle. If it doesn't work, try another one. Think about what it is you're pitching. Think about the response you're getting to it. What's working, what isn't? Unfortunately, sometimes something might work on one day, it might not work on the next, or vice versa. You're all indie game developers or publishers, you're all making a game that you are genuinely passionate about. How can you convey that passion to the journalist you're talking about? Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I just realized I was talking pure rapid there and I'm actually way ahead of time than I expected to be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a mic coming your way. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was pretty loud. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of like timing uh, for a German journalist, uh, what do you feel is the adequate amount of time for something that you want to review, whether it's a small indie game for something mm. that's like maybe a few hours long yeah. or versus like, and, and versus like a triple-A game that may, you know, be like an 80-hour game. How do you how do you manage your time between those different kinds of titles? Because obviously games are so extremely varied. Yeah. I think like for me, we usually recommend anywhere between four weeks before. Um, just to give journalists the optimum amount of time to play them. Because if they're playing other triple-A games, they might already have quite a busy schedule giving them maybe a smaller indie game or even something that's maybe bigger, they can play in between, maybe take a break from what they're doing. But four weeks is a great amount of time for them to maybe play it all the way through, put it back down, come back to it in a week's time and think about what it is they've actually experienced. And then you'll find that the article is much better because they've had time to think about and write about the game that you've given them. All right. Thank you. If that Thank makes you. sense. No, that makes absolutely perfect sense. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Hi. Oh, wow. Um, hi, I really love the talk. I specifically wanted to ask about when you were saying about SEO mm -hmm. and how, if you have any advice for how to approach media in a way that's SEO friendly and the way where they can be like, we can definitely run with this and this will work mm -hmm. in a way if your game is telling particularly like difficult narratives that's coming from quite a personal place mm -hmm. and how to kind of approach that kind of like you know, do I have to sell myself sort of simplify my story or how, yeah. to, how to kind of approach that? I think the thing with SEO is that it's it can be great for some games, but it's not always great for all games. And sometimes, like particularly if it's a narrative game, maybe the fact that it's a narrative game is the stronger pitch. I think, as I said, like trial and error, speak to journalists and see, do they respond well to what you're saying about it being narrative and personal? Because that actually fits in really well with the who part of the angle, who you are, why you're creating the game. If they don't respond well to that, then maybe have a look at the SEO game. Maybe have a think about things that games that are maybe not doing exactly what you're doing, but are maybe similar to what it is you're trying to do to give them an idea of what it is exactly you're trying to achieve. It's not always foolproof. Like I said, it's hard with indie games to be really hyper specific about the do's and do nots about pitching, but trial and error. See what works for you when you try the first time and then learn from it and try again. Cool. Amazing. Thank you so much. No worries. Like that, um, oh, booming, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's a really illuminating talk. Thanks for that. The my team and I are working on a, a multimedia mm -hmm. horror action comedy, really mm -hmm. ambitious franchise. Mm -hmm. and actually, starting with a graphic novel and movies. But yeah, the games coming later. And I'm just looking at. That. I think the principles sound like they'd apply anyway. But do you have any other sort of specific things that you think we should consider? I think that. without having seen what it is you're yeah. doing, it's really hard for me to advise exactly yeah. on what would be good pitching wise. 
um, I think it sounds like you've got quite a lot going on. So maybe focusing on the bits that you think are the strongest and would maybe get across to the journalist exactly what it is you're trying to achieve the easiest way. And then if that, as I said, if that doesn't work, have a look at the other bits that you think are also the strongest and try those. But like maybe just trying to make sure that your pitch is as simple and easy to understand as is possible. Yeah, great. Thank you. No worries. All the questions are coming now. This is great. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. In your experience, uh, mm -hmm. can you think of any real? Oh, that's a bit. Okay, back. Uh, really successful. <laughs> uh, what I was asking was, uh, in your experience, uh, can you think of any really successful campaigns for indie games, like things that you would point to? Like you mentioned, Cabernet is something mm -hmm. that uh, that that is very close and you've been involved with. Yeah. You kind of referenced. Dad as a really strong kind of concept mm -hmm. um, but other others that you kind of point to and say learn from this mm -hmm. I mean I think we've worked on quite a few titles that have done well for various different reasons and um, so Cabernet is a fantastic example because it's actually blown up on TikTok people absolutely <laughs> love it um, and that is partially down to the fact that we have an amazing TikTok, TikTok person in house at Neon Hive and she totally knows what she's doing and it's brilliant but I think with <laughs> With indie games, there's always a different reason why something does really well. Um, so for example, like with Cabernet, it's done well on TikTok, but it, we also did really well when we initially started pitching the previews and that's down to David's fantastic work. That's nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to think if there's anything else off the top of my head that's done particularly well for us that I would highlight. It's hard because everything, I, you know, everything's your baby for a different reason. <laughs> and you're always proud of it for doing something a bit different. Like we've secured some fantastic interviews and features over the year. Like for example, we worked on Scavma last year. It was brilliant. And the features and interviews we got for that were fantastic because that game had such an important message giving the writers and the publishers and the developers time to talk about why they were creating that game really lent well to helping potential players understand what it is they were trying to achieve by developing it, if that makes sense. But there's always a different reason why I think something's successful to be fair. <laughs> Hello. Yo, sorry. Um, yeah, so obviously like, You've spoken about uh, like trying to find your journalists and stuff like that. When you're actually trying to contact them, mm -hmm. how do you recommend going about the subject line on the email? Because obviously that's going to be the first thing that they actually see in their inbox. Uh -huh. Well, that's my favorite thing because it depends on the game, right? But generally it's recommended that you, for some time, sometimes emojis are great, but sometimes emojis get picked up by spam filters. Um, try and keep it 10 words or less. Um, because if it's too long, it's just going to end up cut off in their inbox. They're not going to be able to read it and try and put your game name closer to the start as possible so that they instantly recognize what it is you're trying to contact them about. But sometimes you might have a great pun or a good joke that works really well with the game that you're completing or maybe instantly gets across what it is you're trying to achieve. I also think it's like a personal preference for a lot of PR. So the way I do subject lines is sometimes different to the way my colleague David does subject lines. It's different to the way Matt or our influencer manager does subject lines. Depends on who you're talking to and what it is you're trying to achieve ultimately. But generally the 10 words or less works pretty well across the board. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else? Ooh. Mm -hmm. I guess it's going to be different per journalist. Is it best mm -hmm. to email, DM, try and mm -hmm. get a call? Like, what's. Yeah. Because I guess you don't want to get lost in those 100,000 yeah. emails. You want <laughs> to be able to have a conversation and be able to communicate something. So, yeah. what's so your perspective there? I wouldn't recommend calling. Um, I think that's probably something like a lot of people would have done in the past, but I don't think it really works as well anymore, mostly because I don't think many people actually use their phones for calling anymore. <laughs> You're more likely to give someone a bit of a fright if you try and call them. Um, I find that works best that unless I know the journalist personally, or I've maybe had a couple conversations with them previously, I don't tend to Twitter DM them. I usually email them because sometimes I feel like Twitter DMs can be a bit more personal, but if you have met them and you do know them or you have some sort of relationship with them, I'm sure that's fine. Just keep it very short and brief. Um, I also think that you have to be careful about cross-platforming as well because you might end up having a conversation over Twitter, try and continue that over email and then bits of it might get lost. I find it's much easier and simpler to just stick 
with email because then you have a whole copy of your conversation. They know exactly where it is in their inbox. So if they are interested in following up with you, they will eventually come back to you because they know where to find it. Whereas like journalists get probably hundreds of Twitter DMs every day. So yours might like sink further down the list, if that makes sense. Thanks. Cool. Anyone else? No? OK, cool. Magic. Thank you so much for coming to hear me ramble for 45 minutes. <laughs> If anyone does have any further questions, you maybe didn't want to put your hand up, you're more than welcome to come over and ask. Um, also, here's my contact details if you want to get in touch. I know Twitter's dying, but I sometimes vaguely pay attention to it. Um, or you can email me at my email address. Cool. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>